just to give you some uh, context, um, back in November, I, I started a series of uh, talks uh, here at uh, Beth David here in Toronto uh, on uh, some of the research I've done over many, many years on science and the Bible and how the one verifies the other and to some extent. And it's been something I've been interested in since I was uh, um, at uh, my private high school, uh, which uh, chat here in Toronto, where there were a lot of questions that uh, I wanted answered and didn't seem to ever be answered because they were things that uh, we were told, you know, we were too young to understand or, you know, things that we would have to learn at some future time. So. I took on the challenge and over the last uh, 40 some odd years, I've uh, done a lot of reading outside and uh, a lot of Torah study, Gemara study and other, many other books that I've read that have actually given me a real perspective on the history that's associated and the science associated with the uh, Bible. I'd like to dedicate this talk. Uh, I dedicated the original series to my parents who had the foresight to send me to a private uh, Jewish school, but I want to dedicate this one to uh, Rosalie uh, Selick and uh, Bela Lubeck, who are the outgoing co-chairs of our adult education committee. And uh, Rosalie, after the end of the five lecture series that I gave, thought this is the one that she enjoyed the most. Uh, unfortunately, she's uh, tied up this morning and can't see it for the second time, but uh, I just want to acknowledge them and all the work they've done. And uh, she helped Francis negotiate the Zoom uh, complexities here. And uh, so I'd like to thank her and uh, I hope gets word, word gets around to her that I've dedicated this uh, talk to her. So this was the series that I put together. And as I mentioned, I, um, I'm happy to reprise any of these if some of you didn't get a chance to hear them or uh, if you wanna hear it again. Uh, these are the ones that I did. Now, number five, the Holy Ark and where the temple lay on the Temple Mount. That one I gave to this group uh, on April the 3rd. It was in conjunction with a talk that I give to the chat grade 12 class every year at my alma mater. So that was prepared for them. And I've been giving that every year at the uh, school and uh, offered it here. So some of you will have heard that. That's number five. Today, we're going to do number one. And the one that, if you're interested, I'm happy to uh, reprise number two, which is the creation story and the Purim to Passover link. Uh, by the way, there's uh, things included in that talk that are not known and are not available in any source uh, in Jewish um, liturgy. So um, uh, there's some interesting things I think that you might find uh, uh, of interest in uh, that if we do that. Also dating the patriarch and matriarch age and the Joseph age using many different science and historical documents. Uh, talk on the binding of Isaac, the Akedah, where I think that this was not a trial of Abraham, but a sign and it's uh, using science to try and explain this enigmatic uh, episode. And finally, a, a fun talk on Kabbalah, geometry, modern geography. I've given that in a number of venues to a number of groups. Some of you may have heard that in the first uh, iteration of my talks, uh, but I've given it at other venues. I've also given it at Limud. And by the way, at Limud this year, I put in the request to do the um, Binding of Isaac story. And if they accept it, uh, it will be one that I will be giving in November, but I'm happy to give that separately again. And those of you who are at other shuls or other organizations, I'm happy to give any of these talks to uh, other uh, organizations and other shuls, um, hopefully in live when we're allowed to uh, uh, meet uh, in person. But um, you know, these talks are ones I'm very happy to share, and I'm happy to do any of these talks or series, um, and also with the new talk that I'm preparing for you. So, in all of those five or six of those six um, talks, these are the areas of science that we had to touch on, some many times, some once. Uh, but this is the area, the various areas of science that you really need to have some familiarity with in order to understand some of the work in the Bible. I'll tell you which ones we're going to touch on in just a few minutes, but um, the four of the talks, of uh, those six talks, deal with the narratives of Genesis, Exodus, and these are the specific topics that we deal with. So the science behind the creation story, that would be a talk if you wish to have next week. But uh, today we're gonna do the Garden of Eden and the flood epic. 
the dating of the patriarch and matriarch age, and the Akedah. These are narratives in Genesis that I've researched over many, many years and uh, wanted to share some of the events. So the timelines are what we try to fill in. These are all the questions, uh, Marx, that deal with the timing of these various episodes. And in these uh, initial four talks that I give, gave, uh, we actually were able to get pretty close to the dating of when all these events uh, occurred. And the exodus from Egypt was actually inferred from the story of the Akedah. So that's quite a stretch, but it actually works. And it's something that I can give uh, at another time. So we're dealing today with the Garden of Eden and Noah's flood. I just wanted to show you some of the references. There is a book, if uh, I gave, I brought these books in when I gave the first talk back in November. This is a book called Noah's Flood. It's written by two authors, Ryan and Pittman. And they are marine archeologists whose work I will uh, discuss uh, when we talk about the flood. When we get to the Garden of Eden, this is a book that I used. It's uh, by uh, Andrew Collins called Gobekli Tepe, The Temple of Watches and the Discovery of Eden. And it's a historical and archeological and astrological uh, source that talks about what this uh, enigmatic uh, re uh, archaeological uh, site was, and I'll be talking about that a little later. And the other things I've used you'll see here uh, are these various other sources, and these are just the tip of the iceberg among the things that I've had to read. So in blue are the various areas of science that uh, we'll have to utilize for today, and uh, with each other talk I'm going to use the same chart and show you which areas of science you need to be able to understand. Now, don't worry, we're not going to any deep science here. It's all gonna be understandable and basic, so hopefully you'll learn. Now, we're gonna start with the flood epic. Now you're gonna say, why start with the flood epic if we wanna go in chronological order? The answer is because if we can date the flood epic, we can date the Garden of Eden. So I wanted to start with the flood epic and uh, try to find when there may have been an episode or a uh, situation in history that conforms to all that we saw in the Bible and all that we know archaeologically. So let's pose, there's three questions I want to pose. First of all, why are there over a hundred flood anthologies throughout the ancient world? Now that might surprise you, but many of you will know that the flood epic in the Bible, in the story of Noah, is one of many, many similar stories that go back thousands of years. Now, how did we end up with a hundred flood anthologies? And it turns out they're all in different languages. Secondly, what is the connection of the flood epic to the story of the Tower of Babel? Now in the Torah, the story of the Tower of Babel comes right after the flood epic. Now, there is a very sagely saying that we have it says, Ein mukdam Torah. It means that you cannot use the Torah to look at history in a linear way. There are several contradictory historical events in the Bible that don't make sense in the order that they occur, but probably occurred maybe in a slightly different order as related in the Torah. But the sages and modern rabbis will tell you, we can't use the Torah as a historic document in terms of how lit history flows because the Torah was making certain points around certain things. But in this case, the Tower of Babel following the flood makes absolute sense, as you will see later on. And the second thing is, I always make the point when you're talking about science and the Bible or the Bible itself, to go back to the original Hebrew. You can't appreciate the nuances of the Torah or the rest of the Tanakh without looking at the actual Hebrew words, and they mean an awful lot. And in the talk that I've pre I'm preparing about the hidden meanings of the he biblical Hebrew, the use of the words and the way they're constructed and their values are paramount in understanding what the concepts are. So the elements, as I've given with each of these talks, what are the things that we have to put together, the jigsaw puzzle to figure out how to analyze the historical context of these events? First is the Gilgamesh epic. Second is, the again, the terminology in the text. And what did the Torah say about the site called Ararat? The Babylon Tower and the dispersal of the languages. And finally, the geologic record of the Black Sea, which is 
in modern archaeology the keys to understanding the flood of Noah. So let's start with the Gilgamesh epic. So I mentioned that there are dozens of anthologies that are very similar, similar stories, even with the birds that were sent out with these protagonists who built boats to save themselves and their families. The most complete narrative that is similar to the Bible comes from this epic, which is a series of stone stelae from the libraries of Sumer in South Iraq. The, there are three editions. So just like now we have multiple editions of things, there were multiple versions going back to the third millennium BCE was the original. And in modern things, those of you that are following and love um, comic books, there's a comic book here called The Avengers, and they've actually made movies of these characters. There is a gentleman at the bottom there with the uh, shield and the star, and he is called The Other. And he is actually the forgotten one whose name is Gilgamesh. And he is the protagonist in this modern uh, cartoons, who's actually based on the character in these Uruk stele from thousands of years ago. So Gilgamesh resurfaces 5,000 years later in modern comics. And um, the mo most complete version of this epic is from the 18th century BCE. There are 11 stone tablets and on the 11th tablet is an account of a king of Uruk who meets a protagonist by the name of Utnapishtim after a long search. And this Utnapishtim has is somebody who survived a flood several thousand years earlier. That's in the account. So if he's meeting him in the, let's say, third millennium BCE, and he meets somebody who is on the story, documenting a story from several thousand years earlier, that gives you a clue as to how ancient this story is. There are similar accounts to this Gilgamesh epic in many other sites, stories that they found Iraq and modern Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and so on, and Israel. The question is, how do all of these different sites come up with the same story and the same kind of motif? And it gives you the archaeological basis of looking back and saying that there must be a folklore that was passed down from century to century because nothing was written down, as far as we know, until about the fourth or third millennium BCE. And you can imagine from oral traditions, these stories would have been embellished and, and, and developed some kind of, you know, extra uh, bonus kind of features, which would teach you lessons, such as in the uh, Torah, the story of Noah teaches us many moral and uh, physical lessons. And uh, there's teaching in all of these other anthologies as well. And over many, many years, they would have had some kind of um, change until they were finally written down and were applied to the meaning and the social constructs of those particular peoples. So there must be a common source. You can't have so many similar stories, including the one in the Torah, without a common source. Now, what about the terminology in the Torah? In the Torah, chapter 7, verse 11 of Bereshit, you have the words nivku'u and arubot. These are very powerful terms that only appear, as far as I know, in two or three places in the entire Tanakh. I believe they appear in uh, Tehillim. I, I, I believe that they appear in Tehillim as well. But the words in the original Bereshit, in, in the story of Noah, is these fountains burst apart. There's something that was absolutely, uh, you know, powerful, some powerful images that when they were written down several thousand years later meant something from generation to generation of a powerful event that was seared into the memory of all these people over many, many generations. And when they were written down, you had these powerful, the fountains burst apart, the floodgates of the sky burst apart. These are not just rain. I mean, that's what the Bible talks about, rains that came down. This is not geshem, which is the Hebrew word for rain. This is bursting of something that was seared into the memory of these people. The other thing is a misconception that the ark of Noah settled on, her, on the Mount Ararat. It did not. It landed on the mountains of Ararat, Hare Ararat is the plural. It didn't mean specifically Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat exists today. It's in Eastern Turkey. 
and uh, it's located here in that area there. And if you look very closely, you'll see that beside it is a mountain range called the Armenian Highlands. The Armenian Highlands is the modern term for what in biblical times was called the Hare Ararat, the mountains of Ararat. So that's the area where all the action for this lecture and the, both parts of this lecture are going to occur. Because around the Armenian Highlands, around the Armenian Highlands is where the action of the Noah story and the Garden of Eden all occurred. So we're not talking about Mount Ararat, we're talking about the mountains of Ararat. So here in modern Armenia is their capital Yerevan in the eastern part of what are now the Armenian highlands. This is the capital of uh, Armenia and you can see Mount Ararat in the distant um, vista there and that's what the mountain looks like. People have talked about finding pieces of wood and images of what look like arcs on Mount Ararat. Nothing has ever been conclusively proven and uh, it's a misreading of the Bible to think that it's actually there when it actually they landed on Mount er the mountains of Ararat. So this is the area of ancient Armenia, which was much larger than the current county or, or a country of Armenia. And it's here in Eastern Turkey. And I'm labeling now the Black Sea. And you can see that it's all in the same geographical area. And the Black Sea is the key to the entire understanding of the flood of Noah. So here's ancient Armenia. There are the Armenian highlands, which in biblical times were called Hare Ararat. And this area includes Eden, as we'll discuss. So it makes sense that the entire geographical location of these two contiguous stories from Adam through to Noah, those 10 generations, which we assume lived in a common geographical area that those 10 generations would be linked in the same area of the world. Now what about the Babylon, tire, uh, Babylon Tower? The main thrust of the story, now there are ziggurats that were built and God saw that man was trying to build and reach the sky and so on. Those are stories that probably derived from the ancient cultures that built huge towers. We have the towers of Babylon. People build what were called ziggurats, which were big tall towers um, to as a central part of their communities. Um, so I'm not going to go into that, but just go into the one aspect about the, pop, about the linguistic aspect. Once God dispersed these people, he dispersed them so that according to the Torah, they no longer spoke a common language with their fellow men. And as I mentioned, this follows the, the flood story, but it's a perfect sequitur, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. So let's recapitulate. There's a memory of a great deluge that impacted people's minds to call the floodgates of the, of the sky opened and the extreme huge water accumulations and so on that dates back thousands of years from these anthologies. And the collective memory extends over a large area of the known near and middle east of the time. Whatever vessel it was landed in the Armenian highlands or what the Bible calls Hare Ararat and that there was a mate following that a major dispersal of people across a region large enough that over thousands of years when they eventually wrote down their anthology that they recalled from their ancestors, the languages were no longer in common, but the story thread was very, very detailed and common. And now we come to the thrust, which is the marine archeology span that uh, Pittman and Ryan claim is the um, source of the Noah flood story and the anthologies of all these peoples. One thing you have to look back first is the glacial cycles over many, many um, millennia. And there was the last ice age occurred between 16,000 and 10,500 BCE. Following that, there was a shorter ice age called the Younger Dreyas which lasted about 1,500 to 2,000 years. Following this smaller ice age, the temperature of the earth started to warm. And that's a very important clue. So here we are in the timelines. You can see that you have these, about these ice ages going glacial and so on over many tens of thousands of years. 
in the last one was up to 9500 BCE. Now, here we are back to ancient Armenia. There's the Black Sea. And there's something unique about the Black Sea. According to Ryan and Pittman, it is unique in the world, and it's the only body of water in the world that is composed of an upper level of fresh water with freshwater fish and life and a lower area, or lower volume of salt water. Now you're gonna ask me, as a chemist, wouldn't they just submerge? The answer is yes, but not in this case. So you have to go to an inorganic chemist to figure out exactly what happened, but the engineers, marine engineers, have documented that this can only happen in one scenario. And that's an enormous and sudden influx of salt water into a fresh water lake. There is no other explanation, and it happened to had to happen quickly, a matter of weeks. So where could that have occurred in the area of the Black Sea? It's a sea called the Mediterranean Sea. The Black Sea was originally a small freshwater lake, freshwater lake, and here we are in a short period of time, it becomes a two-layered, enormous uh, body of water with fresh water and salt water below. There's only one source of salt water that could have provided the volumes to create this two level. And that is the Mediterranean Sea, which converted this small freshwater lake until 6500 BCE. It was known to be a freshwater lake and there's the Bosporus Strait. That's the modern geography here. And it changed that small here, this small body of water, this freshwater lake, into this huge body of water of two levels of that size. So it meant 20 to 30 times its size. So after 5500 BCE, this body of water was no longer a small freshwater lake. It was actually a huge combined fresh and salt water like that. So sometime in that interval, a very major catastrophe occurred. And the way you can depict it is this way. Here's the Black Sea with fresh water on one side of the mountains there, that's at the Bosporus Strait. The Mediterranean Sea, composed of salt water, but after the Young Drias, that's after 9500 BCE, as the warming of the earth occurred, the salt, the waters of the glaciers would have melted and the volume and the size of the oceans would have risen. And eventually the Mediterranean Sea as well would have risen because of the melt waters over hundreds of years. And as the ice age melted, the Mediterranean Sea would have enlarged, risen, and at some critical point, somewhere around 6000 BCE, it would have broken through the Bosporus Mountains and intruded into this freshwater lake, as I've depicted here. And this is now what Ryan and Pittman, they actually have the evidence for this. The seas would have invaded, and now you have a two-layered body of water that eventually rose itself and then eventually reached equilibrium as we have today. So for the last 7,500 years, the Black Sea has been stable. The Mediterranean has risen and fallen, you know, with uh, climate change and so on over many years, but they've reached equilibrium and this is the situation we have. So the engineers, marine engineers realize there is only one event that could have accounted for that. And that was the sudden intrusion of the Mediterranean Sea into the salt, into the freshwater lake. So that, is a unique phenomenon in the, in the history of the Near and Middle East. There is no other event like this that would have been recorded that recently to the event. Nothing that we have recorded from ancient times, pre, you know, prehistoric people and so on. So this is an explanation that could give us the entire story. Now, according to Ryan and Pittman, the force and volumes of this waterfall, and I'm gonna call it the Floodgates opened. And actually, um, somebody mentioned to me when I presented this in November that there were actual waters that rose from below as far as the Bible was concerned. And the Midrash says that the waters came from above 
and from below. Well, that makes absolutely perfect sense because you've got the waterfall 200 times the force of Niagara Falls coming at you from above and the waters seeping and growing from below into your communities. How would the ancient people, how would our forefathers have written this down 6,000 years later or 5,000 years later? The floodgates burst open and the floodgates came forth. So how appropriate to use this terminology and because of the, con the confluence of all these anthologies, if they're talking about the same thing as the other hundred uh, ethnic groups, this must be the event because it occurred in the right place at the right time with enough time, thousands of years, for it to percolate and sear into their memories and come back at us written down with this terminology. So originally this was the freshwater lake after the inundation, it would have expanded to that size. And from the marine archeology span of the Black Sea, they have actually found evidence of habitation in the area where the freshwater lake originally lay. And at the onset of the deluge, the families seeing all of this catastrophic, the Mediterranean Sea coming at you from above and below, they would have had to scatter in all directions. And only the families who had boats and could take whatever they could on short notice would have been saved. And they would have scattered in all directions, just as the anthology suggested. But those that could not escape would have drowned. When the Bible came around to talking about these peoples, they were talking about the evil generation and the Hamas that God eliminated. Well, if people had been living in an agrarian society for hundreds or thousands of years, there would probably be some bad apples. And who knows what their ethic uh, makeup was. We have no evidence of it because they were all drowned in that. But uh, all of the work, the, the story that came around that was talking about the elimination of an evil generation. So all the people who were drowned out would have been the ones who could not get boats and they would have been drowned and their civilization would have been lost forever. And we said the story of the Tower of Babylon came right after the genealogy of Noah with the thrust that they no longer spoke a common language with their fellow men. And that makes complete sense because if all these people were scattered in all these different directions, they had to find new places to live. And after two or 3000 years, they would have been using the same motif of their story, but they would have had their own language. So the fact that there's a dispersal of languages and the story of Noah was written down in many different languages, not the story of Noah, but this uh, deluge in many different languages makes absolute sense that the Torah would put the scattering of languages right after the story of Noah. So recapitulating now, everything we mentioned is to include that there was a major dispersal of peoples across a region large enough that their languages were no longer in common but they had the searing memory of that event and would have then put it into their written languages. And if they were faithfully transmitted from century to century, they would have had almost the same story. These dispersed clans would have all had collective memories of the same great flood. That answers question number two. Eventually, millennia later, at the dawn of written records, they were written down their versions and each clan would have its own protagonist, different names, as these stories do, and in their own indigenous language. This is five out of the hundred. These are the most complete and well known. The earliest one is from Sumer, from the early third millennium BCE. In written in cuneiform, the protagonist there was Zio Sudra. The Sumerian and Akkadian, the Gilgamesh epic is the most complete written, as they say, in three versions over a thousand years. The protagonist in each of those stories from all three versions was Utnapishtim. In Assyria, the, the protagonist was Atrahasis. Ancient Greek actually has a version, similar version. We're not sure, the, uh, apparently they can't um, find the exact origin to know who the protagonist was. It's thought to be somebody named Diodorus. And lo and behold, one of the most recent, and I'll emphasize recent, of the anthologies is from our Torah, 
which is in ancient Hebrew, and our protagonist is Noah. So that's why they're all different protagonists. The other anthologies have different names, and they're very incomplete, but have similar motif about a boat escaping a deluge. Now, how long did it take for the salt waters to fill that Black Sea, that little waters? Well, at the start, they say that the shoreline advanced at least one to two miles per day. So there's the uh, Torah telling us that it came from below as well as from above. So every day, one to two miles encroaching upon those freshwater um, area with all the inhabitants around there. And after it became a two layered sea, it became 20 to 30 times its original size. And how long did it take to reach equilibrium? Well, they figure that the height of the Bosporus Mountains that the Mediterranean Sea broke through was 360 feet, give or take. The estimated rise was nine feet per day. The estimated time to reach equilibrium, 40 days. What does the Bible say was the time of the flood? How long did the flood waters rage? 40 days and 40 nights. And the terminology in the text is really again the key that something catastrophic and major must have occurred. And here's, uh, this is something we saw number uh, just a couple of years ago uh, in uh, North Carolina. This is a little pendant of Noah's Ark. I can't explain all the animals. That's the folklore that we have in our story of Noah about the two at a time or seven at a time. That was part of the folklore that developed around the story and the meanings of all of the other things that went on about Noah's interaction with Hashem. Those are all things that got part of the teaching of this episode, but the hardcore history is this, that the flood of Noah, if it is the same story that is in a, throughout the Near and Middle East in all these anthologies, was from a catastrophic inundation of the Black Sea in the sixth millennium BCE. The seventh would be the seventh millennium BCE, somewhere between 6,500 and 6,000 BCE. That's the end of part one. So the next step would be to take this and figure out when the Garden of Eden existed. It did exist. I don't know about a garden, but Eden existed. And we can use the Torah now to find out exactly where it was and when it was. So I thought maybe, honey, if we wanna unmute, if there's any questions so far, otherwise we'll uh, barrel on to the next uh, part of the story. Any, any questions? All perfectly clear. Okay. I have a question, Steve. Yeah. What's the civilization, the farthest, that's the farthest away geographically from uh, where this took place? That is a great question. And from what I understand, although I haven't really researched it, would you believe that there are the um, First Nation peoples of North America who have a similar story? Yeah. And there's also in Africa, uh, I'm not sure if it's in Kenya or Malawi, there are peoples there who have an ancient history in their language of a great flood that occurred that dispersed people from a certain site. So it reaches very far and wide. The, the problem with the... Um, North American version is that the Clovis people and the people who came into the um, Americas, probably over the Bering Strait, which at that time was a land bridge, came tens of thousands of years before this story would have occurred. So it's very interesting, unless there was some travel between Europe and North America, um, and some peoples from Europe managed to get over there sometime between 6,000 and 3,000 BCE. Uh, if that occurred, then there may have been the transfer of this knowledge there. But it's very interesting that the furthest away I know of is in North America. Um, and how it got there, maybe someday I'll find out, but right now I can't tell you for sure. Okay, so... We're going to barrel on now. Here we go. Part two. <clears throat>
Before I get to part two, a lot of you know that I like to include some little historic uh, items. And I think I've shown this to some of you. Some of you at Beth David will know this or will have seen it already. This is uh, the earliest known shopping list. And uh, if you uh, want to look at this, you can see that whoever did this wrote in a beautiful script as well as figures. Because the person who wrote it didn't uh, want, to, want to make sure that if the person who saw this was not literate would be actually able to figure out from the pictures what it is that he wanted. And if you turn this upside down, you'll actually see that the person who wrote it signed his name here. And if you can make out the, the uh, word, it's Michelangelo. When he was up on the trellises doing the Sistine Chapel, he didn't want to have to come down off the trellises and go and get whatever he wanted himself. He decided to give it to an aide. And so he dropped this shopping list down to his aide who then took it to do the shopping for him. So this is Michelangelo from the early 1500s when he uh, painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling, earliest known shopping list. Okay, so here is the science of the various things that we wanted to uh, discuss. <clears throat> so we have Noah's flood. The question is now what about the Garden of Eden, which is depicted in chapters two, five, and six of Bereshit. And here are the questions that we have we can answer. First of all, what seven things did God put into place before creating the universe? Second, how many generations, how many years elapsed among the 10 generations from Adam to Noah? Where were Mount Armon and Eden? And who were the Nephilim, Giborim, and Watchers? Now, these are terms that have been very enigmatic and have led to a lot of mystic and other conjectures and astronomic things. There's actually an explanation of who these people were, and I'm gonna give it to you uh, just very briefly in uh, just a few minutes. According to the Midrash, Hashem created seven things before he created the universe. He created the Torah, which was the blueprint for creation. And this is in the Midrash Rabbah, by the way, on Bereshit. Number two, he instituted the act of tshuva to maintain human existence. The Garden of Eden he created to ensure reward for the righteous. He also developed Gehinom as a punishment, Kisei HaKavod, to manifest his glory in the world. He actually designed the Beit HaMikdash for the Shekhinah to dwell, and he also created the Shem Mashiach, which is the humanity's goal to reach the days of Mashiach. So among these mystic sort of uh, Jewish uh, Midrashic kind of concepts, the Garden of Eden was one thing that according to our Midrash was created at the onset of time. The elements to understand the Garden of Eden and its location is first of all, again, timing and locating Noah's flood, the overlap of ages and the fact that there were righteous among the 10 generations. Again, we go back to ancient Armenia and what was called Edenu. By the way, in ancient Hittite and Akkadian, ancient languages in the Near East, the proper names had the U at the end that denoted a proper name. So the name of the spot in Armenia is actually Eden in modern terms, but in that time it was called Edenu. And the Bible, the Torah gives us the exact location of Eden or Edenu, I've got an Aden, using four rivers and three gems. So let's go back just to recapitulate here, the location of these events that came 10 generations later than Adam was this Black Sea inundation, where the ark settled on the mountains again, I'll emphasize it's mountains, not mountain, which is located in Eastern Turkey. So this is where the action was. There are the Armenian highlands. And I put that in because that is the area where Noah's events occurred there and just north of there. And it makes sense that the generations that preceding him would have come from the same area. There's ancient Armenia again, and ancient Armenians have sagas as well. People from India, um, people from various the Egyptians, all have anthologies that go back thousands of years before ascended, which describes things that were in their oral history going back thousands of years. And so we know that there were um, peoples who actually had 
anthologies going back that far. And in the ancient Armenian sagas, they actually describe this land. So that's where, according to Andrew Collins in his book, that's where the name Eden actually came. So here are the Armenian highlands. And we talked again that the timing of that event, of the flood of Noah and the settling of a vessel or the boat in the mountains of Ararat, well, let's say it's 6500 BCE. Now we have to look at the ages of the descendants of Adam. According to the Torah, there were 10 generations, these 10 generations, and they lived enormously long lives. Now, what I'm gonna suggest is, I'm not gonna go into, being a doctor, I don't know that the human race ever had longevity of this long, but let's say for argument's sake, that the writer of the Torah, when the Torah was written, that they weren't so interested in the length of their ages, but more about the time span that they lived through. In other words, maybe there were more than 10 generations. If we look at it medically and logically, but maybe they were simply filling the time with the most important personalities of those generations and wanted to fill up time to bridge the Garden of Eden time with the flood of Noah time. Now, if you look at these ages and you add them all up, that would give you an enormous number of years of those 10 generations. But that is not the way to look at it. The time span is not one person's age, the next person's age, the next person's age, next person, sorry, lifespan. It's not a lifespan added to a lifespan, added to a lifespan, added to a lifespan. You don't add their total ages to find the lifespan. You have to add the overlap of the ages because person one will have a child, person two in the generations. Person two will have person three partway through their life. Part person three will have person four and so on. You have to look at the overlap of the ages. When did certain person, um, when was somebody born during the age span of the first person? The, the, when someone was born in the age span of the second person? You have to look at the overlap of these ages to find out exactly how many actual years passed. You don't add all their ages, you don't add all their lifespans, you add the overlap from one generation to the next. And if you do that, these are the number of years that actually passed. I hope, hope that's understandable, right? So even though they all had these enormous long lives, it's the overlap from one person to the next that you add up to actually tell you how many years passed. And if you add that up, it's 1056 years. But Noah, if you look at the very bottom here, here's Noah. Noah was 500 years old before God told him to build his ark. He spent another hundred years building the ark before the floods came. And you know, the whole Midrashic aspect and the commentators talk about why was Avraham considered the first protagonist, the Ivri, and Noah was a tzaddik in his generation, but he didn't argue with God, whereas Abraham did. You know, there's a difference in the sort of uh, personalities that are highlighted as to why one was a tzaddik but the other was the one who become the first father of the Jewish nation. And that's because Noah spent 500 years and then 100 years building his ark, but didn't try to warn people to, uh, uh, to, to change their ways in the way that Avraham argued in his time. So let's add the 600 years of Noah's life and the building of the ark. And now we have almost 1700 years as the actual years spanning from Adam to Noah and the flood. So now, if we say that 6500 BCE was the flood of Noah, and now you see why I did that story first, because now we use that as the marker. We have that pretty secure. Back up now 1700 years, and that means that the Garden of Eden is from the ninth millennium BCE. Does that make any sense at all? I wouldn't give you this talk if it didn't make sense. So the answer is absolutely and it's corroborated by several things. So we're gonna journey into history. This is modern history. This is the desk and the office of somebody very famous on the day he died. And if you look into the 
relativity equations on the blackboard, you'll see that this is Albert Einstein's office the day he died in 1955. And uh, thank goodness my desk doesn't look quite that cluttered, but I don't feel so bad when it is. <laughs> okay, now, what about the righteous among the 10 generations? So among these individuals, these personalities, there were some bad apples and some good apples. The worst apple was a guy by the name of Enosh who actually instituted idolatry. But he lived to a nice ripe age of 905. The good guys, the good cowboys were Yered, Enoch, and Metushalach. Two of them lived among the longest of the um, group. But this guy, Enoch, Chanoch in Hebrew, lived a very short life relative to the others. And there's a whole mystic philosophy and stories about this guy. And he's written about in the fifth chapter of Bereshit. He was said to institute prayer according to the Midrash Rabbah, but he was removed before his time. And it's thought there's all kinds of explanations from the Midrash was to prevent corruption due to the sinfulness of man, which was already percolating among the last two or three generations before Noah to give the biblical context for why there was a flood. He's one of only nine biblical personalities allowed into the Garden of Eden alive. And it goes back to what I said at the very beginning, what seven things did God create before he created the world? One is the Garden of Eden as a place for the righteous. There's actually a book called the Book of Hanoch the Prophet, which is actually in the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek that was done over many years in the second century BCE. And it has translations of the entire Tanakh, as well as many other books called the Apocrypha, which are books that circulated in the Jewish realm and beyond, but were not included in the Tanakh when it was put together. But the Septuagint has a translation of this book, as does the Coptic Church of the Ethiopian Church has this book in their canon. The Ethiopian church is very different from the regular Catholic church, and it's a whole talk on its own, which I can give some time, but they have um, practices from the first temple period, believe it or not. But that's a whole other story. But basically, the um, Coptic church actually has this as five volumes where the fifth is probably added on at a more recent time because the Septuagint has a translation of the first four sections of the book of Hanoch. It was written no later than the sixth century BCE. As I say, it's not in Tanakh, but we do know it from other sources. And he actually wrote, this book actually talks about some of the events in Bereshit, about Nephilim, Giborim, and Anakim. Anakim, are thought to be a race of giants. They appear in several portions in the Tanakh and in the Torah. There's Og, Melech HaBashan. Og was the king of Bashan, which was one of the countries that uh, the Israelites conquered uh, on their way to uh, Canaan. And he was said to be from the Midrash up to six meters tall or eight me or seven, nine meters tall or his bed. I think they did it from the size of his bed. He was nine meters or nine cubits, sorry nine cubits long, which would be a huge gentleman. And Anakim were also one of the uh, people that were alluded to by the spies that Moses sent, the 12 spies that went into the land of Canaan, came back talking about Anakim, about giants who existed there that made them feel like grasshoppers in their midst. So there are these references to these people. This is also reflected in the Midrash Rabbah has the exact same motif with the same names of these people. They actually name who some of these people were. And this, this uh, book of Hanoch introduced the terms of sons of heaven and angels. And it dis dis discusses the exploits of these watchers and these Anakim who were called the Anunuki. And he also dates these events, wherever the, whenever they occurred, to a place called Mount, Mount Armon, or Mount Ardis. Mount Armon is now in the Armenian highlands. That's where the name Armenia comes from. The ancient name Armenia comes from Armon, 
And so these events in the book of Hanukkah and in the Midrash Rabbah are coming from a time, according to Armenian literature, that dates back thousands of years. This is from, I have the actual book, I have the book downloaded. And you can see here, if you can read that, that in there, in the early chapters, it says, when the angels, sons of heaven, came enamored of them, saying to each other, let us select ourselves wives from the progeny of men. They're talking about the civilization that existed around the Armenian highlands. At the bottom, they all swore together. They all had themselves by mutual. The number were 200 who descended upon Ardis, which is the town of Mount Armon. This is also reflected in the Midrash Rabbah. So you wonder whether the writers of the Midrash Rabbah actually had the book of Hanukkah hundreds of years earlier, or the, uh, the sources that the Septuagint used, that they had this book as part of their, their thing. So the story is also in the Midrash Rabbah. So we now can talk about Armenia that is actually referred to in Jewish sources. It's also referred to in ancient Armenian sources in the area of the Black Sea, which makes sense. And that brings us now to another site. There's a site that I showed you in this book that I showed you called Gobekli Tepe, which is a very ancient site from the ninth millennium. It's located in central Turkey with many stone circles with large T-shaped stone pillars with mysterious etched figurines of very tall people. This site dates to the ninth millennium and the orientation of the circles is thought to coincide with the fragmentation of a comet that hit Europe in the 10,500 BCE. This is the design of that site. You can see that there are stone circles, and I'll make the point that this is 5,000 years before um, Stonehenge. It's also 3,000 years before Rogham Erie, which is another stone circles in Israel. It's at least three to 4,000 years older than that. So this is the oldest known astrological, circular, or whatever it was being used for site. And there are several, there are at least five different circles in this one site. And they have stone figurines that represent what they're thinking. And this is in the book by Collins, was a Caucasian race who invaded and came from an area north of the Armenian highlands. There are graves in what's now Belarus of a group called the Swiderian culture, who were Caucasians that were very, very tall, and they have their skeletons to show that. And it's thought that they actually came into the area of the Armenian highlands, into the area of Gobekli Tepe, which means that these were the tall Caucasians who came into the area of what was ancient Armenia in the area of what we're talking about right now with the uh, flood of Noah, a uh, few several generations later, but there would have been a recollection of people coming from, you know, these, this race of people who were very tall and came into that area. So here's where it's Gobekli Tepe, and I'm just enlarging here the area that we're discussing, because if the Armenians are talking about the source of their liturgy, their liturgy being from this area of ancient Armenia, the Book of Hanukkah talks about. Um, events that are in the Bible, very briefly, there's only a couple of psukim that actually talk about the Nephilim and talk about the people who came into that area and interbreeded, but it's all related in these anthologies and the Book of Hanukkah and the Midrash Rabbah may be referring to that particular event. I'm not gonna say for sure, but it's just that they all are contemporary and contemporaneous and all in the same area. So there's Mount Arbus, which is in the Armenian anthology. It's in the Book of Hanukkah. So these events happened in that area of Mount Arbus and Mount Armon. And so everything comes together beautifully into this one area, the Hanukkah and Asagas, the flood of Noah. And now we approach the definition of where Eden lay. And I'm showing you right here the answer. This is where the Garden of Eden was. It was a lush, very lush plain in an arid area. And the question now is, can we actually be sure that that's where it was? And the answer is, let's now use the Bible itself, the Tanakh, let's use the Torah. The Torah tells us in Bereshit that there were four rivers around Aden, Garden of Eden, and three gems. 
The four rivers were the Gihon, Prat, Chidek, El Pishon. The gems were Shoham, Bedolach, and Zahav. Let's talk about the four rivers. The first one is Frat. Frat is known to be the Euphrates. We have the Euphrates in modern times as well. It's called Nahar Prat. And the Chidekel, which was the Tigris, is now the Tigris, originates, lo and behold, in the Armenian highlands and flows south from Armenia. What about the Gihon is now known as the Araxes River and it flows north from the Armenian highlands. And the Pishon is one of two rivers that we have in modern times called the Perishu or the Great Zab, flows south from the Armenian highlands. So here are the Armenian highlands, the Frat, is there, that's the river flowing from the, around the Armenian highlands, around Eden. The Chidekel is just south, flowing from the Armenian highlands. The Gihon is the only one that heads north, that's this one. And the Pishon or Perisu, there's two possibilities. The one that is thought to be the most likely is the Western one called the Perisu or Pishon. These are the Turkish names for these, uh, um, rivers here. So all four rivers are in the right place. It's the only place that satisfies the biblical criteria for these four rivers. There's nowhere else in the nearer Middle East where this could exist. What about the three gems? Gold, which was also mined in a place called the Chavilah, that's also in the Torah. The land of Chavilah is here and just east of it. You can see here, that's the land of Chavilah. But gold, the highest concentration of gold that was mined, and the geologists, again, who wrote this book, claim that this is the highest concentration and was mined as far back as several thousand years ago. That's how the kings who ruled in the near and Middle East were able to obtain gold. It was imported from this Armenian area. The Bdolach is a type of resin and as best, that's also located in the land of Chavilah, which is here. And finally, onyx or obsidian was mined in many places. The largest concentration was right here. And notice that everything is surrounding the Armenian highlands. All three gems mined in the area of Aden. The Torah is telling us exactly where it was located, modern, um, marine archaeology has shown us where all these different elements occurred. So the location of the Garden of Eden is right where I'm showing you, and it makes perfect sense because for the 10 generations leading to Noah, or those 1700 years, if there was an agrarian civilization that then suffered the effects of the flood, it would make sense that it all occurred in the same area and the Armenian literature also tells us that this is where Eden, Edenu, existed, ninth millennium BCE in the region of ancient Armenia. So we now can label the timing of the Garden of Eden. Now, whether it was a garden, we don't know, but it was actually a very lush area with lots of, apparently, they have evidence of lush trees and vegetation from that area. And the last thing I'm going to say is, are, are there any anthologies that reach back to the earliest time of human settlements, which this must be? Agrarian settlements in human history started around the ninth millennium BCE, and religion began there as well. And it would make sense that the Gobekli Tepe people who built those stone circles would have been um, well immersed in that and a sedentary population. In Sumerian Akkadian mythology, the Tigris and Euphrates originated from a primeval water source under a certain god. So this goes back to ancient anthologies about the Tigris and Euphrates, and it's a motif from thousands of years before. The Armenian folklore I've been referring to talks about a god who transformed and slayed another titan, synonymous with biblical Nimrod. We have the name Nimrod that pops up several times in the original chapters of Bereshit, and then again uh, during the time of Noah. And he lived in the first generations after Noah. So this is, again, from the Armenian literature going back a long time. 
Egyptian mythology does not begin with the first dynasties in the third millennium. There are actually papyri and stones that talk about a first time and that the time of the pharaohs was actually the fifth time. And these first times, when you add up the anthologies, they actually have names of kings that preceded the pharaoh dynasties, and it goes back to the ninth millennium BCE. An Indian mythology called the Rig Veda describes geographical features and a recurrence of civilization reaching back to 8,000 BCE. So even in the Indo, um, Europe, Indo, Euphrates, uh, Indo um, Indus Valley civilization in India, they have records going back from their anthologies passed down orally and eventually, eventually written down going back to 8,000 BCE. So the Torah that takes us back to the land of Eden, if it is correct that it's back to the ninth millennium, we have a lot of good company from several other civilizations whose records go back to that very, very primitive dim past that was eventually passed down, all those stories and personalities passed down until written down, starting with the written words in the fourth millennium BCE. So we now have filled two of the blanks here. Uh, the other two blanks are filled in by some of my other talks. And uh, by the way, I've shown this to a number of you. This is the what the uh, Northern Lights Aurora Borealis looks like from the International Space Station. This is from above. So we've seen it from below. You've probably seen pictures and videos. This is what it looks like from above. So these are the uh, elements that we came up today. And now I'll stop. Uh, and I take any questions. Um, I have a question. First of all, Stephen, thank you so much for such a well-researched and fascinating talk. That's first thing. Second thing I wanted to ask is when we do um, memorializations of people who have departed, we pray that their souls be bound up in the Garden of Eden. So is that in the next world or this world? Or what is the connection there from the garden that's here and then for the souls to be bound up there? I think, you know, that's really interesting. And the richness of Jewish liturgy and Jewish history and our religion is that we've taken some of these really, some of these historic details. And when they were written down, eventually capsulized in the Torah, it built up a whole religion and a belief system and a whole num amount of mystic and other kind of, um, what we call it, iconic kind of concepts that are teaching us lessons. So I think the credit to the Torah, the writers of the Torah, if we believe it's Hashem or Moshe, have taken these events and made it a learning experience for us and a, 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 pra you know, learn a practical practice. And in among all those uh, philosophies that have arisen about these events is the concept of the Garden of Eden as being a special, special place. Um, from the very beginning of the Torah. And what I mentioned earlier about the seven things that God created before he created the universe, that we believe that the uh, Garden of Eden was created, but it won't be a physical one, Gail. It would be a, mis a, a sort of philosophical or soul-searching kind of um, God-given thing that we can't put our fingers on, but it's something that we aspire to as a direction to keep to make our lives richer and that we should fulfill our lives as much as possible so that we can achieve the greatness and the stature to, to merit going to this idealistic place. So, you know, Eden is symbolic with idealism and perfection, panaceas and so on. So I think it's a philosophical concept um, that comes from the Midrash. And it's something that I think was built because of the impact that this area had unique among all the places that God labeled it for the Torah to deal with it and to make it a special place. And I think it's really the word special place and ideal sp space that uh, we would aspire to. And I think that that's where it comes from. Okay, thank you. Stephen? Yeah. It, it, thank you so much. It was so fascinating. I've got so many questions, but I do have to ask you, when you talked about the ages of the ancients, and you explained that so beautifully. A year was not measured as we know a year, like 12 months. 
could a year not have been measured through perhaps growing seasons as well? That's, that's, an ex that's an interesting question. The question is, are years in the Bible based on two Rosh Hashanahs? That's what you're alluding to. When, right. the, when, the, when the Torah was given, right. did Nisan, then the first of Nisan, and the first of Tishrei become beginnings of quote-unquote years? Right. What I'm saying is, let's be simpler. Now, you're looking at the drush. When you look at biblical narratives, there's four, I don't know if you were at my lecture of the uh, Akedah, there's four ways to look at the passages called pardes. Okay. There's, the pay is for pshat. It means the simplest part, the simplest explanation, just what the text says. The dalad is drush. That's the midrush that takes it a little bit deeper and uses anecdotes and philosophy to get more meaning. Then there's remez, which is an illusion that you can almost, if you're smart enough, you can get the hint of what's going on. And the samech is sod. Sod means that it's something you cannot learn unless it's God-given. It's something right. beyond human understanding. So you're using the drush to try and explain how these years are long. I'm using the pshat to say, maybe there weren't, to let, I'm sorry, don't be heretical here, but let's say there were not 10 people in line. Let's say there were a hundred people in line, but they took the most significant personalities and the writer only wanted to fill the 1700 years. Right. It didn't matter how many people, he wanted to get the most important ones in there, but let's say they were just looking at the pshat of how many year, real years, our human years, actually occurred. And that would be filling it up to fill up 1700 years. And it turns out if you use the pshat, you don't have to double the number of years oh. to include other years. You just take the Bible literally, take the overlap of true human years, backs up 1700, and you come exactly to what the history says is where Garden of Eden existed. So I don't think you have to make any further discussions. I think the Bible tells you exactly where it was, shut from all those rivers. Okay. It also gives you the timing from the shut of the number of years. Don't look at the number of people and their ages. Look at the number of years that overlapped. Thank you so much. And this was so fascinating. Thank you, Stephen. Yasha Koach. Any other questions? I think, uh, Hun, did you unmute? Uh, I think you unmuted everybody. There are any other questions or comments? Uh, again, you know, I, I gave this talk in November and I got some interesting feedback uh, about certain words and concepts, and I tried to include them. So in a sense, this talk has been updated, um, but it's the core is basically the same as you would have heard uh, six months ago. So the question is, would, would you like to gather again next week for the- Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, very absolutely. much so. Absolutely, yes. Okay, okay. so um, again, it's one that you would have heard, but if you weren't able to be there or you wanna hear it again, uh, I'm happy to do the uh, Bereshi talk again. Um, and could, and, could you send uh, out the, the coordinates, please, for the... Well, what the we'll have to do, yeah. So the process is that it's usually announced on the Beth David website, but what I'll have to do... More. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get a hold of Helene today and uh, get her to send me some new coordinates. I feel like I'm on Star Trek here. The coordinates... Uh, <laughs> star date 38 14.5 you know i got my big ear i got my big ears got my big ears i want you all to prosper by the way um did that very well yeah if i can say stay healthy and you will prosper right yes um so um by the way i'm gonna give you the word uh kahlo. okay what is that it's actually klingon for thank you I, you know what? I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Okay. I, I left it as a prize for one of my colleagues who couldn't figure it out on a webinar. Um, so, Kwatlo <laughs> is uh, thank you in in. Um, thank in you. Um, so, what I'll do, I'll, I'll speak to Helene, and um, the best thing I can suggest, uh, I'll you know, I, I have most of your emails. So, the group that I emailed this past week, I'll try to include all of you on a mass email. Uh, but it's the best thing is whatever uh, did did you if, if you were able to get on it today, uh, it should be accessible next week. It, but, it, um, it, it was accessible through the Beth David email that came yeah. this week at Beth David, which came out on Monday or Tuesday. And, okay. And yeah. if anybody read uh, uh, 
uh, Andy's, Andy's comments, none of this information is no longer available on the website or through Facebook. It's all only available embedded in the ads that come on the weekly email. So there might be one today uh, in the Shabbat Shalom, and there'll be another one next week, Monday or Tuesday, in this week at Beth David. Oh, but that's okay for Beth David people, but if you don't belong to Beth David, you wouldn't know that. Uh, then you'd have to get a separate email from, from Beth okay. David. Okay, or you, you I, could contact us, or you could contact the synagogue. Yeah, contact Okay, us, thank you. And, and, and they'll, they'll include you. Yeah, what I think I'll do is when I get the coordinates like I did today, Gail, uh -huh. and Steve, et cetera, et cetera, Paul, everybody, uh, glad you could come. Um, I will, because uh, I have all your emails and let you know separately, I will send you a separate uh, link of okay, coordinates. Okay, thank you so much. And thank then you. we can beam you aboard. <laughs> I hope you weren't bored, but we'll make you. Uh, it was excellent. Thank you. Be, really beam excellent. me up, Scotty. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. Very okay. Thank you so, so much. Really fascinating. Thank you. It was okay. fabulous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Really, really good. Great. You're very welcome. We'll see you at uh, Kabbalat Shabbat later. Right. Yes. yes. Thank you and Shabbat Shalom. Okay. To everybody. And Shabbat Shalom to everybody. Yeah. It's Friday Shabbat already. Shabbat. Yeah. Yes. Stay healthy. Yeah, everybody. You yes. too. Stay well. Stay Thank healthy. you to Honey. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so well, much. Nice to see Thank everybody. you, Francis. Bye, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom, everybody. How do you get out?